My name is Peter Murphy from the Politics and the Pub Committee. I'm the MC tonight. Welcome all of you out there in the ether. I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation where I am, and we can all pay respect to the elders of the land on which we all are today. The topic tonight is uh, Iran takes Australian hostages. What is happening in the Persian Gulf? So tonight we're shifting our focus from the pandemic, the economic crisis, capitalism, etc., to an important international flashpoint, the Persian Gulf. Australia has had diplomatic relations with Iran from the time of the Shah in 1974. Our foreign affairs establishment is particularly proud of that. Uh, on the other hand, every year Australia co-sponsors a Canadian resolution at the UN General Assembly that criticises the shocking human rights record of Iran. Australia's low profile presence in Iran got shaken up in July last year when two young travel bloggers, Jolie King and Mark Perkin, were arrested for taking drone images somewhere near a military site. They were released in October last year in an apparent prisoner swap for an Iranian doctoral student from Brisbane who was facing extradition to the USA for alleged sanction busting activity. But about that time, the British media revealed that a UK Australian citizen, Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert, had been in prison for almost a year. And that was part of a 10 year sentence for alleged spying. The Australian government continues to urge calm <coughs> to her family and friends, asking that they be allowed to quietly negotiate for her release. Uh, that strategy doesn't seem to be working. Um, the larger context has been the extreme pressure from the Trump administration on Iran over its nuclear program and Australia agreeing to uh, contribute quite token naval and air forces to protection of tankers, oil tankers in the Persian Gulf. Our speakers tonight are specialists in this area, uh, which is largely ignored in Australia's media and public debate. Why are these Australians being grabbed now? What could Australia's government do in this new situation? Uh, what can the Australian public do? Why is it happening? So our speakers, uh, uh, Karim Purhamzavi, he's uh, teaching at the Department of Modern History, Politics and International Relations at Macquarie University. His current research focuses on the historical correlation between jihadist movements and global hegemony. Karim's research uh, within the discipline of international political economy is a sub-branch of political science um, and, and has produced multiple publications in English and Farsi. He's been a, a visiting fellow at uh, Lund University and at Glasgow University. And Greg Barton is now the professor of global Islamic politics at Alfred, the Alfred Deakin Institute at Deakin University in Melbourne. He began his academic career lecturing at Monash uh, University in 1993. At Deakin, uh, he became an associate professor of politics by the time he, he left there in 2005. He was uh, an associate professor at the Honolulu-based Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in 2006 and seven, after which he served as an adjunct professor. He returned to Australia that year and accepted the position of Herb Feith Research Professor for the study of Indonesia at Monash University and uh, now is in his current position. So they're really well uh, qualified for uh, tackling tonight's topic. The first speaker is uh, Karim Pohamzavi. Um, uh, he, he, each speaker will present for about 20 minutes or up to 20 minutes and then we'll go straight into the question and answer session until we've dealt with all the questions or we reach 8.15, uh, whichever comes first. People can put their questions in the Q&A uh, uh, facility on the Zoom screen. Um, we'll see where we are at the end of the presentations with the questions. So please uh, welcome Karim Puhamzavi to the microphone. Go ahead, Karim. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk about the topic from uh, an international political economic perspective for two reasons. Um, to first to provide a uh, larger uh, or broad picture, uh, which involves Australian Middle Eastern uh, relationship, and then to narrow down this uh, uh, topic to the micro level of um, Iranian um, Australian relationship. And hopefully by the end of this, we can make sense of 
um, why, for instance, Australian citizens um, are getting um, arrested or hostages in Iran by the Iranian authority, of course. Uh, the second reason is uh, because the second part of the topic, what is happening in the Persian Gulf, is really part of, is really part of and, and continuation of what is happening in the in the region for the last two hundred um, years and so. This also this um, of course involves global rivalries, um, in which Australia plays a part. Uh, the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. Uh, has been attractive for global power uh, throughout modern history. Uh, this can by itself be divided into two uh, sections of prayer, uh, discovering and exploiting uh, Middle Eastern oil and then um, after this period. Through the 19th century, uh, the Middle East uh, was, and, and the Persian Gulf was particularly uh, attractive for geostrategic reasons. Um, for instance, as we can understand from the um, British uh, officials, uh, uh, the colony of India was so crucial for the for the uh, uh, British Empire, and that's why regions such as Iran and, and uh, Afghanistan has to be dominated in order to safeguard that uh, uh, colony. Um, steadily, the, the Persian Gulf gained its own uh, significance for the, the for the colonial powers, like by. Uh, by the end of um, 19th century, over 80% of the trade was uh, conducted by British subjects and over a period of 50 years, we are speaking about over 20,000 of um, British uh, trading ships and steamers. So huge um, interest in terms of trade. Also another aspect of, of the significance of the region was uh, uh, particularly after the American Civil War, uh, some regions such as Egypt and, and Iran were uh, important for growing corps for international markets, <laughs> or such as cotton in Iran and both cotton and uh, cotton in Egypt and, and both cotton and uh, uh, opium in, in Iran. Um, in the first decade of the 20th century, uh, Precisely, the Iranian oil was significant for the British to uh, uh, to actually win the, the two world war, the first and the second war. In the first uh, world war, uh, exploiting the Iranian uh, oil was so crucial for the British that Churchill himself uh, was in charge of the uh, project. Uh, because that's the, the, the oil was to turn the uh, uh, the, the, uh, the British, uh, the engine of the British Navy from steamers and, and coal-based engines to uh, oil, and, and that was something that only the British could do and uh, Britain could do, and, and that gave them an upper hand in the First World War. In the Second World War, also, like, um, oil-thirsty Germany uh, and the whole industrial uh, project uh, of Germany needed oil, which the Soviet Union, as the only supp supplier, was uh, preventing uh, selling oil to uh, to Germany, and again uh, taking over as an occupation of Iran in 1941. Taking over the Iranian oil by the British was also crucial um, to win the Second World War. <laughs> so this is the dynamic of of global rivalry uh, over the last uh, 200 years. But when it comes to Australia and even New Zealand, uh, the definition of the state in, in, uh, in these two countries is uh, uh, they define themselves as part of a larger alliance, um, be it uh, the Commonwealth, for instance, or even Western Bloc in different time and place, um, different uh, titles were, were, were picked. For instance, uh, some would prefer a capitalist alliance during the Cold War. But anyway, um, there is something that uh, makes the, the, the foreign policies in these two states unique compared to even other hegemonic and Western allies. Uh, I find that, uh, and by foreign policy here, I mean uh, the involvement of Australia in overseas uh, and imperial wars. Uh, 
Um, also, we have to know that we are speaking about minor as a minor party. Yeah, I'm not comparing Australia here is, uh, with Britain, but also there was certain involvement. Uh, probably the best way to summarize and describe this is a quote from uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister uh, Michael Savage in 1939 before uh, New Zealand involved in the Second World War, when he referred to, to the Queen as wherever she goes, we go. Similar quotations and tendency uh, can be found uh, among Australian politicians at the time. And um, that's, all of this means that wherever Britain involved in a, in a certain war, and here I'm talking about the Middle East, uh, these two states will, will follow. Uh, so uh, this particular uh, character uh, or, or characteristic uh, distinguish Australian uh, foreign policy even from uh, other uh, Western allies. Uh, and by allies, I mean allies of the over specific hegemonic power, first Britain and then after Second World War, uh, the US. Um, this, if we can put it in a form of like absolute loyalty to the global power is, is kind of different from uh, uh, for instance, uh, European stance, when uh, they, their foreign policy is more based on calculation of the, 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 the cost and benefit of their action. Um, for instance, uh, France and Germany, uh, they, they both opposed the occupation of Iraq and they, did, they didn't involve in that. Um, and even Britain, which is which is known as a, as the uh, strongest uh, U.S. ally um, in the in the recent summit in the in the UN Security Council, uh, they voted alongside uh, other European and even China and Russia when uh, uh, the United States was demanding the increase of sanction as a result of of uh, pulling over of the uh, nuclear deal with Iran. Uh, so, uh, and, and we have to note also both, uh, both policies are conscious, like the European uh, were consciously planning uh, when they were planning the, the, the next stage of, of their alliance with the United States in, in, in the post-colonial um, period. Uh, they were uh, determining that, yes, we are part of this alliance, but for instance, when our interests demand and when we can, we would take a, an, an independent stand, stance. Uh, also, uh, we usually hear in, in Australia, we hear a lot about the Anzac War, which happened to be a tragic for the involved um, forces, the British, New Zealand and Australian forces. But paying attention to the details of other wars that Australia was involved in um, also help us to unpack the complexity of this uh, alliance and the history of it. I have two examples here. Uh, the first was um, in the first world war, war or precisely in 1916 when Britain was able to, uh, uh, to make an agreement with the Arabs to turn against their previous uh, allies, the Ottoman Empire. Um, and uh, uh, basically by promising them an, an, an uh, Arab state, which later uh, the British didn't give that to the, to the Arabs. But anyway, in, in 1960, uh, 1916, the, the Arabs were, um, uh, were willing to fight beside uh, the British and French uh, uh, forces against the Ottomans. One of these uh, battles, which um, proved to be difficult for, for the Allied forces, was in Damascus, which in many ways was, was the second uh, uh, capital city of, uh, of the Ottomans. Um, it was well defended, and it wasn't easy to even inf infiltrate the, 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 the city. Um, so it was sieged um, for several months, months and eventually in 1918 it, it falled uh, and the, the allied forces were were uh, uh, able to enter the city so the australian forces were were the first forces to to enter the city at least from the eastern gate 
The second um, example is actually about Iran in 1941. Uh, when the state, when the Iranian state was subject to occupation by um, mainly three uh, global forces, uh, global powers, um, UK and uh, the United States and the, the Soviet Union from the, uh, when they occupied the northern territories of Iran. Um, of course, uh, each of these uh, global powers had their own uh, motivation to for that occupation, but again, the first navy to land uh, on Iranian soil was the, was the Australian navy, or among the first uh, uh, forces to land uh, on the Iranian or, or also the Australian forces. <clears throat> um, Australia maintains similar strong uh, allies with the new uh, with, with the United States, which which emerged as a glo global hegemon power um, after uh, the Second World War. The Cold War also uh, turned the Middle East as an entire, uh, uh, as a state, entirely state, um, as, a, as a stage for, for um, a proxy conflict between this time Western Bloc and Eastern Bloc. But um, post Cold War even turned more dramatic uh, for the for the Middle Eastern states. And um, from 2003 and starting from the occupation of Iraq, series of war and, and, and uh, interventions uh, took place in the Middle East, which Australia again found, found a place uh, uh, in most of them. Uh, this again, as, as we talked, like some European powers uh, didn't uh, support all of these interventions and they dealt with them case by case. For instance, in the, in the, in the Iraqi case, um, some of the European powers didn't uh, um, participated in that war, but in the Libyan case, uh, all of them, uh, or through NATO, the, the Libyan state was invaded. So um, let's come to the more recent Iranian-Australian uh, uh, relationships. Uh, well, uh, Iran is subject to sanctions, and uh, most of the sanctions are approved by the UN, and nobody can blame anyone, uh, including Australia, for taking part of uh, the sanctions against Iran. But uh, what I'm talking here about are, are, about are sanctions that uh, took place after um, the US uh, withdrawal from uh, the nuclear deal which was signed between Iran and some uh, uh, six global powers. Um, and the Trump administration um, returned back some of the, the uh, sanctions or even imposed uh, uh, more sanctions on, on, on Iran. Um, again, well, the, the Europeans, they didn't uh, want to, or they don't want to jeopardize their interest uh, and their trade with, with uh, both uh, US and regional allies, such as Saudi Arabia and others. Uh, but they still, they have their own say when it comes to sanctions against Iran, um, including the recent, uh, uh, the recent summit in the UN, they voted against uh, renewing the sanctions and they committed to what they have signed in the nuclear deal. Uh, this is not the position of Australia. For instance, Australia, when, when there is US sanctions against Iran, Australia take that seriously. <laughs> uh, then again, uh, in, in a recent uh, uh, tension between the US uh, and, and Iran, the tension was not entirely based on economic uh, sanctions. Part of it was uh, even military uh, pressure. Uh, the two states were so close to get into war against um, each other. Um, as a result of, or, or part of this uh, tension, um, Trump administration declared uh, uh, the, the departure of global forces to protect the, uh, uh, the Persian war. Uh, well, this plan didn't uh, work well, firstly, because it wasn't practical. Uh, in both sides of the Persian Gulf, there are sovereign states. Um, again, um, the whole process is highly costing. Um, and what's the legal base for that? Is it a new colonization or what? Uh, so even among the very few countries which supported that, including uh, Britain, which symbolically sent a battleship and then uh, withdraw it back. Um, Australia also supported this uh, uh, 
to U.S. administration uh, plan. What I'm trying to say here is the tension in the Iranian-Australian uh, relationship already exists. The relationship uh, is not um, normal. So we are not talking about, for instance, um, uh, Australia-Saudi Arabia relationship. Uh, <clears throat> so having this in, 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 in the background, or let's uh, turn to another flashback, what is happening in Iran and what's the nature of politics there and how this may enable us to understand why would the Iranian authority take the uh, Australian citizens or some of them as hostages. The current, the current ruling elite and political establishment in Iran are product of what happened in 1979. Uh, the event is commonly referred to as a revolution, but I don't think technically it is accurate to call that revolution for many reasons, which are not relevant to, to the today topic. But one reason is there is no revolution that give birth to, for instance, a theocratic political establishment. Um, as, as is the case in Iran, and Iran is actually the only theocracy in the world. So as a result of that, as a result of, of the coming into power of the Islamists in 1979, mass executions happened and followed. Um, we don't have the actual numbers. So, some would say thousands, uh, or actually ten, tens of thousands. Some, some observers, such as Robert Fix, uh, who spent uh, time in, in Iran during, uh, in, in 1979, um, would say that uh, the numbers are hundreds of thousands. So high brutality against Iranian society. Then at the same time, in 1981, 80, uh, Iraq launched a, a large, uh, large scale war against uh, Iran that happened, uh, that took, uh, that continued for, for, for eight years. Iraq itself was supported by both uh, Western and Eastern uh, uh, powers, uh, including some regional uh, Arab states. Um, but again, uh, another factor that turned uh, too dramatic on the Iranian society was this international sanctions which took place as early as 1981. Um, well, it's, it is simplification if we say it, it's, it's make Iranian society poorer than it was because we are talking about a society which some 80% of the society can easily be identified as the margin of the society. And uh, like what it means that uh, the largest uh, section of the Iranian population are living either on poverty or below poverty line. So you, so you would imagine what, what, what would sanctions uh, deal with that. And another example that um, uh, happened in the, in the neighboring countries to Iran, uh, none of the states which uh, were subject to international sanctions, Iraq, Syria, Libya, to different extents, Yemen uh, ended up in a in a in a like pleasant fate, if you can put it that way. Uh, all of this in all of this state, the sanctions uh, destroyed the fabric of the societies there, and the subsequent um, interventions uh, destroyed the very notion of the states. Uh, and the societies. So this is the model that put forward uh, to the Iranian uh, society and somehow they are being pub uh, punished for something that they haven't done in 1979. <clears throat> and this is another reason that that's not accurate to call what happened there as a revolution because uh, one has to distinguish between Iranian society and, and the ruling elite. Um, well, I'm, I can't say that the, the ruling elite are in a bad conditions um, as the Iranian society, but uh, as we can imagine that they also have uh, limited options when they come, uh, when it comes to foreign policy. Um, here what I can call, I'm, so, so Iran is the weakest party when it's come to any relationship, Australian-Iranian relationship, or even as, a, as part of the tension between Iran and and regional powers such as Saudi Arabia and Israel. Iran is the weak, the weak party. Um, so, and the weak party um, 
tend toward what I call unconventional politics. Um, I can give an example, for instance, um, Iranian uh, ruling elite uh, spent uh, most of the, the resources in the country to, to develop a missile uh, program, and they were successful in developing that. Uh, not because uh, they are good in, in industry or, or anything else, it was highly costly uh, uh, project, but because nobody sell them a weapon, they can't buy a weapon. Uh, through this unconventional politics, we can understand why the Iranian authority taking literally hostages. So they take hostage to take some concessions, uh, particular political con uh, concessions, including exchange of prisoners. Um, Within this uh, dynamic, I mean, why would someone take hostages? They, they want something in return. And this dynamic, we can understand that uh, why, for instance, um, the Iranian uh, authorities uh, uh, hold this Australian uh, citizens uh, um, and, and uh, pro uh, probably the, the Australian authority is right. They are negotiating a deal currently with the Iranian authorities to, um, to see what they can give and uh, how can uh, they, uh, uh, they get uh, people like Dr. Gilbert uh, released from, from, from the unfair prison that, that she is in currently. I, I will leave it here, uh, Peter. Thank, thank you very, very much, Karim, for that backgrounding and uh, a sort of a, real, a realistic uh, conclusion at the end about the context in which uh, these, these events are happening recently with Australians in Iran. So um, I'd now uh, like to hand over to, to Greg Barton and uh, I'll make him a host so we can do your slides. So over to you, Greg. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you, Karim. Uh, Karim's given a nice broad context to understand what we're discussing tonight. I'll, I'll sort of dive into some of the details and um, present a very simple presentation, uh, trying to make sense of what some of the main elements are. So uh, this is not a very sophisticated take. I'm not an Iran specialist, so I'll, I'll start with that caveat. Uh, but I think some of the broad issues are are clear enough and important enough that we can get into uh, discussing them. So uh, one of the reasons we're having this topic tonight, and I, mean, I think we, we would have been talking about this in any case, but this um, brings into the frame uh, a very personal note, a very uh, disturbing note to discussing the question of um, why states like Iran do what they do, and in particular why they take political prisoners, as we're arguing. So Kylie Moore Gilbert uh, has now been in Iranian detention for two years, and uh, most of that two years has been in, in some of the harshest conditions. Well, all of the two years have been in very difficult prisons, often in solitary confinement, uh, now in Karchak prison, which is one of uh, Iran's most notorious prisons, uh, perhaps the most notorious women's prison, very violent and dangerous place. And uh, this was a, a story that wasn't much discussed in, in recent years because there was uh, the quiet confidence that uh, uh, quiet diplomacy behind the scene would, would save the day and uh, uh, bring about her release. That's still the hope. Uh, this will require quiet diplomacy and the work that DFAT is doing is essential to securing Kali's release. But since her um, recent transfer to Karchak prison, uh, a number of Kali's friends felt that now's the time to speak up a, a bit more directly about her case, uh, not uh, to criticise DFAT, but rather to try and strengthen their arm in doing what's very, very difficult work negotiating. And I'll give my personal take on what I think some of the dynamics going on are and, and why securing her release and the release of others is so difficult. Uh, so Kylie was at a, uh, a short uh, workshop conference. Uh, uh, she was invited by the Iranian um, state uh, back in August of 2018. She elected to spend a few extra weeks uh, uh, visiting uh, Tehran and, and, and speaking to people in Iran because uh, she was very excited to be visiting Iran. She's not an Iran specialist, uh, works on the Gulf, um, works on Arab states in the Gulf, but um, Iran is so important that she was excited to be there. 
And unfortunately, as she was leaving uh, Tehran Airport, she was detained. Uh, she, the authorities accused her of espionage. The particular authorities involved was the um, uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. We'll speak about them in a minute because it's key to understanding why her situation is so difficult. Uh, the federal government has, throughout this two years, maintained that it's the highest priority to, to uh, secure her release. But there is this frustrating mystery as to why we don't seem to have seen the progress you would expect in a case like this. Uh, uh, Kali was taken into Evin prison in Tehran, uh, which is a difficult prison, but she was taken into Ward 2A, which is a, a section run by the uh, 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 Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Uh, in other words, a section of a notorious prison run to hold political prisoners, generally, uh, for the most part, seem to be um, uh, those taken hostage by uh, the Revolutionary Guard for political purposes. And the conditions of that uh, Ward 2A are described as being quite horrendous and uh, often, uh, at least in many cases, uh, involve deliberate psychological pressure to break down those being detained to make them more valuable, amount more malleable to um, uh, signing confessions or making statements which will help in that hostage taking process. In other words, the negotiations behind their release. Of course, uh, there have been many people held in, in uh, Evan prison more recently, uh, Jolie King and Mark uh, Furkin, uh, two young Australians traveling around the world driving over land um, through Asia and uh, West Asia and the Middle East. Um, their trip came to an abrupt halt when they were arrested in Iran, as, um, as Karim was saying. Uh, the charges then were that they were flying a drone in an area close to military facilities, probably an unwitting error. Um, it's understandable that they, they did make a transgression of local law. They were detained for a period of time. Their release, as Karim was saying, was negotiated. In some ways, their case is understandable. Um, they, they made a mistake, uh, not out of bad intention or any sort of knowing uh, intention. Um, and fortunately, the, the, their release was secured, but it did involve some sort of quid pro quo. Uh, the question is, what mistake did Kylie make and, and why has there been no deal forthcoming? And uh, I'll try and unpack what I think might be going on there. Uh, of course, uh, the taking of people um, uh, into detention and, and charging them often with espionage charges is a common pattern, and mm -hmm. it's commonly seen as, as a sort of hostage-taking effort in a bid to try and uh, get some sort of quid pro quo negotiation. Uh, it's become fairly routine for uh, Westerners to detain, uh, be detained in Iran. Uh, it has to be said, though, that the more common targets are uh, people born in Iran, they may hold a dual uh, passports, dual citizenship, uh, but their Iranian heritage and their dual citizenship gives them a particular vulnerability, a pattern we're seeing, of course, with, with China and elsewhere. Um, sometimes the, the targets are fairly high profile. So Jason uh, Rezaian, who was a uh, bureau chief of the Washington Post in Tehran, uh, his wife is uh, Iranian, <coughs> was uh, uh, abruptly arrested charged on espionage charges, held in, in pretty tough conditions. Uh, but eventually, this was during the Obama uh, administration, his uh, release was negotiated. Uh, now, if he'd been detained at this time under the Trump administration, perhaps we wouldn't have seen the same progress. It's, it's a, a even more difficult time. Um, but in some ways, uh, the logic of detaining a high-profile American and trying to extract some sort of um, deal for his release is, uh, is something that we can guess at and understand. It has to be said, though, that a lot of the people detained, as I said, are, are dual nationals and, um, uh, of course, Iranian citizens themselves, uh, just, just regular Iranian citizens protesting, perhaps, or caught up in protests, or uh, perhaps politically active. So um, uh, we have many cases, um, uh, Nazarin, um, uh, Zagari Ratcliffe is, is a high profile case, justifiably high profile. Um, she fortunately has been allowed out of prison detention, uh, still under house arrest, wearing an ankle a bracelet, tracking her movements. Uh, 
the COVID-19 conditions have hit Iran very hard. And of course, they've hit Iranian prisons, as you'd expect, given the pretty rough conditions there, very hard. So uh, Nazarin was held in, in Evin prison. Uh, fortunately, political pressure was applied and she's been allowed to stay with her parents in West Tehran. Still a pretty terrible situation, still very, very concerning. Um, the hope for Kali uh, Moore Gilbert would be that uh, she might be released from um, Karchak prison and released into the uh, care and responsibility of the Australian embassy, uh, where she would be safer from COVID-19 and, and would have a chance to restore her physical and mental health. Um, but there are a number of cases, I won't go into them all, but, but it's fair to say there's a pattern of behavior here. Uh, it's generally understood that, as I said, when, when um, Westerners or dual nationals are taken uh, and detained, it's because they're seen as being political pawns. They are being detained uh, on, on the scope of, of being leveraged for political concessions. And of course, the situation when it involves the Revolutionary Guard, which is a state within the state, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, means that that political negotiation aspect is even more clear cut than when it comes to regular prisoners. Of course, there are um, almost literally countless Iranians who have been uh, arrested. Some of them are very high profile. Uh, some of them sadly have been executed, such as the very tragic case with uh, Navid uh, Afkari, who was executed just days ago. Um, he was caught up in protests back in 2018. It was alleged that he had knifed a security guard in that protest and um, he was uh, forced to sign a confession that was said that he was tortured in prison and, and under duress uh, signed a statement. In any case, um, the state pressed ahead and executed him. Uh, this is just one case I've been amongst many, many cases. So here the state was not looking for concessions. The state was simply intimidating uh, ordinary Iranians and saying that even if you're as high profile as, uh, as Navid was, um, that doesn't make you safe. And it should be explained, by the way, that in, uh, in Iran, wrestling is the number one sport. So if you're a, a famous national wrestler, uh, you're a celebrity. And uh, taking a celebrity, charging them, and then finally executing them is a reminder to all Iranians that, that uh, anyone can um, be subject to the same fate. So it's about the, 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 um, the use of intimidation and violence um, to control the population. Uh, we've had many reports of COVID-19 running rampant through um, uh, Iranian jails, not, not because anyone wishes that to be so, but just because the conditions there are already so awful that they're particularly vulnerable. And of course, Iran as a whole has been very badly hit by COVID-19. Um, there have been many reports coming out of uh, prisons um, like uh, Greater Tehran Penitentiary and even prison talking about the horrendous conditions there. There have been some really high profile, um, very committed professional human rights uh, activists, including Iranian human rights law, uh, lawyer, uh, Nazarin uh, Sotudeh, uh, who's currently on a hunger strike and, and reportedly her health is in very poor condition. Uh, she's been uh, on this hunger strike just recently, trying to highlight the very dire conditions um, of COVID-19. Now, many prisoners, including many political prisoners, have been released partly for this reason in, in recent months, uh, but clearly more needs to be done. Uh, and this is a pattern that goes back decades. So uh, the author Marina Nemet, uh, when she was a teenager, was arrested and sent to Evin prison back in 1982. So uh, 38 years ago, uh, the conditions she described then are conditions that are described today. Uh, it's not a recent development and it's not just recent politics that explains what's happening, although recent politics have, have um, Put this into a focus. Of course, there's been uh, a number of very uh, large protests against uh, the Iranian regime, um, uh, protesting uh, um, uh, uh, unnecessary pressure on, on voting, uh, because Iran still does have voting, still does have elections, so people feel uh, committed enough about that process that they want to protest when they see things uh, being unfair. Uh, I won't go into details of all the protests, but um, in, in recent years, including uh, as recently as last year before COVID uh, broke out, uh, when there were nationwide protests at the time in December last year, people talked about it as being a tipping point. Of course, these things um, 
up until now haven't been tipping points, um, but hundreds were arrested and uh, many were killed in the process. Um, and the uh, reports coming out from groups like Amnesty International suggest um, uh, deliberate use of violence to intimidate and, and to uh, uh, basically send a signal to others that they shouldn't think of being involved. Uh, I mentioned that, that Ward 2A in Evan Prison is a section of the prison system, or it's a sort of a almost a parallel element in the prison system run by the Revolutionary Guard. In fact, there's a very large parallel system. In fact, Iran has a system of parallel, inst parallel institutions, including parallel prisons. Um, and partly it's because the state isn't a, a monolith. The state has parallel institutions within it, and the most important being the, the Revolutionary Guard. Um, in a recent report in the US Department of State, uh, a report to Congress on uh, people that the Department of State were saying were responsible for human rights abuses in Iran, it's interesting to look at the names, prominent amongst the names that come up, of course, are people in, in, in the um, uh, military and in intelligence, uh, but many of them are specifically associated with the Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps. Um, and that speaks to uh, the concern with the Revolutionary Guards. So I just want to conclude uh, this brief presentation by talking a little bit about the Revolutionary uh, Guard Corps. Um, I'll draw on uh, a recent report by um, the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, the report that came out in May of uh, last year, uh, as, a, as a way of uh, sketching out the, the, the key things to understand. So, of course, there was a revolution in Iran in 1979. The revolution had a broad um, alliance of different groups who were unhappy with the Shah's rule and wanted change. Um, but the revolution at the time was seen in, in many ways to have uh, prominent left-wing elements. Um, one of the elements in the revolution that was not properly anticipated at the time was the religious element, the religious political element. And of course that element uh, dominated uh, and um, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps came out of uh, that 1979 uh, revolution. Uh, it has grown through the eight year war with the Iraq that followed that Karim spoke about to become a, a parallel, not just a parallel state, but a parallel military. Uh, so it's not just a small, uh, elite unit. It, it's running um, large ground forces, large naval forces. Um, uh, it even runs an air force of sorts, mainly concerned with strategic missiles. And it runs a civil militia, uh, the Basiji militia that you often hear about when it comes to uh, plain closed, you know, thugs basically um, using force to uh, crack down on demonstrators or protesters or routinely spying on ordinary Iranians for all sorts of um, alleged um, uh, misdoings. It's, it's basically a, a, a thuggish um, uh, paramilitary uh, under the control now of the Evolutionary, uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, not, not initially so, but now under their control and, and used as a way of uh, multiplying their force. So unusual to have such a large, um, parallel military. Uh, they take the titles of being guardians of the revolution. Of course, the revolution, as I said, had, had many different elements uh, at play, but the, um, the religious element came to the fore and uh, the IRGC was uh, founded as a way of giving uh, some military strength to um, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, Islamic leadership uh, under Khomeini. Um, recognizing that uh, given that um, the Shah had been brought down by a revolution, that they also could be suffer, suffer the same fate and they needed some sort of ballast and, and some sort of loyal military force to balance the Iranian military force. Um, so they have ground forces across uh, all 31 provinces uh, of uh, Iran and the capital Tehran. Uh, as I said earlier, more than 100,000 troops. Um, they got six times that many with the Basiji um, Basij paramilitary force. Um, they run uh, some very unusual uh, naval forces, not, not a, a regular Navy, but uh, a fast moving sort of Marine force, uh, but with quite strong 20,000 uh, uh, patrolling the Straits of Hummuz, um, particularly paying attention to oil shipping. Uh, the Air Force, as I said, is not a regular Air Force. It's really in charge of Iran's ballistic missile program, which is 
pretty important when you think about it. They also have a cyber command, um, which is involved in extremely uh, sophisticated and uh, effective hacking and cyber operations. Um, uh, one of the best in the world alongside those run by uh, Russia and China. Uh, of course, Russia and China are much more powerful um, Iran is less powerful, but in, in, in some ways, this cyber division is a, is, a, is a weapon of the week when it comes to Iran. The um, Revolutionary Guard is a, an economic powerhouse. It controls perhaps as much as a third of the Ira Iran's um, economy. And a key thing to understand, um, this is not new, but it, it's become sharpened with recent um, restrictions and further sanctions, as Karim was speaking about. Um, Precisely because uh, Iran has faced a series of sanctions, uh, it's distorted the way in which the economy works. It's given um, particular advantage and leverage to aspects of the black market, and the Revolutionary Guard has proven itself uh, supremely able in this black market uh, uh, domain, um, running various uh, obvious sanction-busting activities, but all sorts of uh, odd and unlikely um, uh, programs around the world, including with groups like Hezbollah that it funds and controls uh, as a way of generating uh, hard currency and um, uh, accessing uh, foreign exchange that can't be regularly ex uh, accessed by the, the Iranian system. Um, and it, it has a number of elements within it, but the Quds Force in particular uh, has been called out as being the element of the Revolutionary Guard uh, most involved in terrorist operations and uh, most involved in um, uh, links with groups like Hezbollah. Now, you know, there's lots of things said about Iran and terrorism, but there isn't the organic grassroots terrorism uh, in, in Iran that we see uh, across uh, Sunni states. It's a different dynamic, um, so the word terrorism is a little bit confusing, although when you look at groups like Hezbollah, you can see that the word is certainly appropriate, but there have been a number of um, extrajudicial killings and operations uh, alleged to be orchestrated by the Quds Force out of um, uh, Iranian diplomatic uh, bases. And of course, in the case of Hezbollah, it's it's more of a full-blown and, and open um, uh, uh, program. And of course, um, within Iran, um, uh, the Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, plays this key role of protecting the regime and, uh, and literally giving them a... Um, uh, a, uh, a Praetorian guard, uh, lest the public should become so upset with the regime that it moves against it. Um, so whether it's by in intimidation through the bus siege or whether it's uh, by rounding up and arresting and detaining uh, in special prisons or, or special sections of prisons, uh, ordinary Iranians, um, this is really um, the basic uh, uh, substance of what the, the Revolutionary Guard does. But it's also active internationally and of course more recently, uh, its activities in providing leadership and direction in Iraq and in Syria have become very clear. There's been this long association with Hezbollah and Lebanon, but now we see very active engagement in Iraq uh, and Syria. We also see more overt activity uh, within Afghanistan um, and within the Palestinian territories. Um, it's a very complicated story. Um, but it's uh, the, the story behind the targeted killing, the assassination of General uh, Soleimani. Um, no question, Soleimani had uh, blood on his hands, uh, a lot of blood, an immense amount of violence. Uh, whether his targeted killing, that uh, uh, strike was a wise or sensible move at the time is another issue entirely. Uh, but it shows the high stakes game that the Revolutionary Guard is involved in and, and what's going on. And it makes sense when you think about uh, hostage taking, that the hostage taking, if it's not for money, is often for uh, an exchange of prisoners, uh, so-called. And because of what um, the Revolutionary Guard has been doing in the region and beyond, there are a lot of people that he wants released uh, from, uh, from prisons in which Western powers have some sway or seem to have some sway. Um, uh, it's hard to see what the uh, Revolutionary Guard sees that the Australian government would give up. It's true that the, the, the two travellers we spoke about earlier, um, there was the exchange, as Karim said, of this PhD student. Uh, it's not clear that anyone uh, is being held in Australian detention um, who would be 
uh, subject to some sort of prisoner swap. It's perhaps the hope is that uh, Australia will, will, will put pressure on America or Britain or elsewhere. It's really not clear. It's also not clear why, uh, if this is not the case, the Australian government's not working with regional powers um, such as, as, as Qatar, for example, uh, that has a long history of having to deal with the Revolutionary Guard and having to negotiate, not, not out of any um, a close association, but out of a real politic. Um, so there is the possibility that that sort of negotiation might be helpful in a case like this. But I mean, there's a lot that we don't know. But what is pretty clear in many of these cases is that the force behind the um, uh, the detention and the uh, harsh conditions designed to break people down and the forced confessions uh, is this uh, political game of, of um, taking people hostage, not just as political prisoners, but as hostages in the hope of securing something in return. And, and that's the, the larger picture here in the case of somebody like Kylie Moore Gilbert and others. Uh, and that's a really difficult thing to deal with. And that explains why it's taken more than two years to secure Kylie's release. But it, it's also the reason why we have to speak up and, and ask that efforts are redoubled because conditions in uh, these jails are awful at the best of times with COVID-19. They're more than awful. Um, plus we have a lot of evidence that um, the Revolutionary Guard uses uh, really instruments of torture, at least psychological, if not physical, in every case, to break people down and, 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 and to make them malleable, to extract something from them. And that means that uh, for people like Carly, these are very dangerous conditions. Karchak Prison, uh, we can discuss more, but it's, it's regarded as one of the most notorious in Iran and the most notorious women's prison. Many of the um, the inmates there are, are violent individuals. Uh, there's problems all the time with violence, and so it's a dangerous place to be at, at the best of times. Hence the sense of urgency in this particular case, but it's it's not just for Kali. It's, uh, this concern should be for many other people, uh, but it needs to be read and within that context. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave the... the slides there and we can go back to uh, you as host if you like uh, Peter and have a discussion. Okay you can um, do that that's great. Okay thank you very much to Greg and uh, to Karim that's really very strong input. Um, we've got a few people with us um, so um, what I thought I'd do um, yeah. Okay. Uh, right at early in the process of developing this uh, event tonight, um, I asked a, uh, another well-informed person on Iran, Alison Bronowski, if she would be interested in speaking. She declined to do that, but asked for uh, something to be read out to the gathering. And I'll, I'll do this as like the first of the Q&A comment things. Um, so uh, you'll find this interesting. She said, uh, I have often had the pleasure of joining politics in the pub meetings and I would happily have been here this evening, but I'm not able to make a case for Dr. Kylie Moore Gilbert against the government of Iran, which is what I was asked to do. It's not quite accurate, but anyway, uh, I don't know anything about her activities in Iran. And if any of you do, you might inform the media, which are as ignorant as I am. If she and the two other Australians arrested for espionage at the same time were spying, it's strange that they were quickly released and she was not. I, I do know a bit about Iran, having lived there for two years and after that staying in touch with friends and events there. Iran lost its first and only opportunity to be a democracy in 1953 when the CIA and MI6 collaborated in overthrowing the elected Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh and replacing him with uh, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, son of the former Shah, whose rule ended with the Islamic Revolution in 79. Human rights under the Ayatollahs are much the same as they were under the Shahs. Whose fault is it that Iran is not a democracy? If we want to criticize the human rights of Iran, why do we not also mention India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Zimbabwe, and numerous other countries? Before we do, we should admit that UN inspectors have repeatedly criticized Australia's treatment of refugees and indigenous people. If we are as concerned about the international rules-based order, in quotes, as our governments claim, why do ministers not complain to the UK government about holding an Australian without charge? 
without proper health care or access to lawyers in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison where two people have died of COVID-19. Why do ministers not intervene with the US administration and urge them to drop the espionage charges against him, for which his alleged co-conspirator twice jailed has been pardoned and freed? If justice is blind, why does it matter that the prisoner is Julian Assange? I don't know why Dr. Moore Gilbert is accused of spying. I do know why Assange is, because in 2010, he published the truth about American human rights abuses in Iraq and Afghanistan. He is seriously ill and may die before they extradite him to the US to face 175 years in prison. In the UK or in the US, he may be found dead of suicide in his cell, just like Jeffrey Epstein. Ministers doing their best for Dr. Moore Gilbert will have uh, Assange's death on their conscience because for him, they did nothing. So it's a tour de force, but it's uh, like a, a pushback, I think, from uh, that, that bit of opinion in Australia, which is uh, doubtful about the charges against Iran in general. Anyway, I'll, if either of you, if you would like to comment on that, um, do so now and I'll look for the Q&A and to see if we've got any questions. Yeah, Peter, I'm happy to make a comment briefly yeah. on that uh, for what it's worth. Um, and I, you know, don't know the broader context and I won't engage with all the issues of the statement, but just say that, you know, I mean, I, I fully agree that uh, there is a lot of injustice around the world and there's a lot of cases where we need to speak up, um, but that should never be the basis for not speaking up uh, when there are egregious cases and we have a particular personal responsibility. So, yes, I, I think there are many cases we should speak up, in, including the case of Julian Assange. I think his behaviour is, is reckless and problematic, but I don't think he should be extradited to the US, and I think we should be concerned about his health. Um, this concern about possible um, mental health breakdown, is, it's, it's very worrying. So I, I, no argument against that. But what has that got to do with the case of, of, of Kylie Moore Gilbert? Um, uh, Julian Assange uh, did something, uh, we can debate his motive, um, but it was a, is a political action. Um, I, I think it was reckless, um, but, but I can see that uh, it's brought attention to some important issues that, that need to see the light of day, so I acknowledge that. Um, but he was a political actor. There's nothing about Carly Moore Gilbert's case to suggest any intention uh, for any sort of political action, uh, much less espionage, uh, she's been under a lot of pressure in prison reportedly to uh, turn and to add, act in a role to support the uh, Revolutionary Guard. Um, she said that she's never been uh, a spy for any state, and never will be. Uh, she's refused to bow to that pressure. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever to support the espionage charges, the Revolutionary Guard uh, and other elements of the Iranian state as well, often bring such charges against people in a way that's completely baseless. Uh, but it's it's a pretext for basically you know putting a gun to somebody's head and saying we're going to fire unless you respond to our demands. Um, so it's it's crude, rough negotiating. Um, you know, if we talk about the, the bigger picture of Iran, I, I think we should have gone about things with Iran very differently. I do think what happened uh, with the CIA coup was you know very wrong and extremely regrettable and, and one of many mistakes made through the 20th century uh, of, of such kind. And I do think we should be finding other ways to engage with the Iranian state and the Iranian people today. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't speak up when we've got situations like that facing Kylie Moore Gilbert and other prisoners. Um, I, I think in, in conclusion, we should certainly make a distinction between the people of Iran uh, who should have our respect and sympathy. And even with the government of Iran, um, which is you know, struggling in very difficult circumstances uh, I, I think we could have a long discussion about which sanctions of any sanctions and what political pressure should be applied. Uh, there's another larger discussion that we have about uh, nuclear weapons development and how best to um, counter that. Uh, but what I've tried to show with this case is that we're dealing with a, a state within a state, a military within a military state, uh, uh, with a long history of very uh, cynical uh, very bloody um, manipulation of circumstances, most of all against the people of Iran, but also within the region. And um, this is a tough, a tough uh, outfit to deal with. Uh, and uh, this is not a case for moral equivalence 
or, or denying what is, uh, you know, uh, one case of many of outrageous human rights abuses of which we should speak out. Okay, Karim, have you got any comment you'd like to make? Uh, oh, well, not really, but just want to comment on, on the question of why, why the current, um, uh, why, there is, why there is no democracy in Iran and why Iran is actually the only theocracy in the world. Um, your, your guest um, commented uh, a, very, uh, a very crucial point um, on, on what happened in 1953, but that, that wasn't the only case where um, global forces uh, turned down the Iranian atoms to, to democracy. Um, before that, in 1941, as I briefly mentioned, uh, uh, there was a like, uh, like native uh, developmental uh, project uh, run by a strong man, not a democratic man, uh, namely Reza Shah. Um, that the, the government was delivering for entire uh, 20 years. Um, the state was highly modernized during his time. Many good things happened, but again, all of that went uh, uh, by the occupation of the country, uh, uh, by uh, the global forces, the Britain, US, and then uh, even the Soviet Union. Uh, before that, in 1906, Iranians actually uh, ran a, a constitutional revolution to, uh, to actually uh, establish a parliament and uh, democracy, basically. And, and some of the intellectual of that uh, revolution um, studied the democracy in the UK to, to suggest it, uh, the same modern Iran. But unfortunately, that attempt was also, the very revolution was, was massacred by, by British and Russian forces, uh, which were dominating the Iranian scene at that point. Uh, the Islams themselves, they were never in the, in the side of the revolutionaries or revolutionaries or any kind of leftist socialist pro masses uh, and pro poor, pro poor people uh, politics. They, during the entire Cold War, even, uh, well, even after that, but let's say during the, the, the Cold War, they were always in the side of CIA, the United States. Uh, and in a larger picture, uh, they have been used against uh, uh, the Soviet Union at that time. Uh, but what happened in 1979 cannot be, uh, in Iran, cannot be uh, isolated from all of these interventions uh, in Iran. And uh, well, systematically speak speaking, the current uh, situation in Iran um, is the reflection of what happened in the last 100th century. Thank you very much, Karim. Yeah. I've got, I've got a, uh, there's a comment come through about the, the uh, which uh, Greg, you could look at, I think in the Q&A, um, uh, just about the right uh, way to talk about Julian Assange, say, compared to Kylie Morgill. But personally, you know, I think, um, you know, it's a distraction. It's a sort of a divide and rule thing to play off one of these victims against another. We have to fight for all these people's rights. Um, in, in the situations they're in. But I've got a bigger question. It's about, um, you know, the, the very hot moment we had at the start of the year, I think, uh, just after General Soleimani was killed and the, uh, I think it was a Ukrainian airline was uh, shot down. Hundreds of people were killed there. Um, and uh, there was a bit, a bit of a fear around the world that there would be a hot war. I think you referred to that before. Um, so what is it looking like now? Um, is is it uh, a, a thing to, we should worry about that between now and the US elections, this could be triggered again uh, for political purposes in the US context? Or um, is it more that we should expect, uh, um, you know, for his own reasons, the Trump, the Trump leadership will, will try to uh, say that he's a peacemaker, he wants the troops home and and there'll be a sort of toning down of things. Um, and uh, is it the case that, say, the, the Iranian government would like to see Trump go or stay? I mean, what would they prefer, <laughs> you think? Um, it, it's a very weird thing. And of course, Australia is an ally of the US in this, and it must be saying something, um, but it's not saying it to the public in Australia. So it's good if the Australian public have got a bit more information about what might be happening, I think. 
Is anyone can answer? Either, either Greg or you, Karim. Uh, well, I, I can comment on, on the, on the uh, US election and uh, what's uh, the politics in Iran. Um, I don't think uh, the, the Iranian uh, decision makers, the Iranian ruling elite, uh, prefer Trump because they were quite happy with the nuclear deal uh, with, which they had uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, so, and, and uh, Trump rises, rose the tension as, as large as could he possibly do. I think he, he would even engage into war against Iran if he could, but uh, the war against Iran was, was so damaging, like Iran can bombard the whole uh, Persian Gulf states by the, by, by this uh, ballistic missiles they have. And by destroying the, the economic um, uh, capacity which exists in that region, uh, the whole global economic, uh, uh, the, the whole global economic system would collapse uh, if any, uh, any tension and, and uh, what happened in that region. Um, so he, he had very limited uh, options in, in attacking Iran and uh, that's why he, he preferred to, uh, to go behind as much as sanction as possible and rally other allies behind uh, his administration. Um, so I, I don't think the Iranian ruling elites would prefer uh, the re-election re of, of Trump. Uh, would Trump do anything in a large scale from now until the election? I don't think so. There is no, no time left. There is no capacity left. Uh, uh, even like the situation of the U.S. as a, as a even global power and global hegemony is different from uh, before the, the, the pandemic. Now we have the tension between uh, really China and, and China and Russia from one side and, and um, United States and some other uh, allies on the other hand. So the Iran situation is, is less important currently until the election and uh, let's see what will happen after the election. Okay, Greg, have you got any comment on that question? Sure. Look, I think there was a, uh, a, there's always a risk, but there was a particular risk that, that Trump may have um, uh, miscalculated to the extent that he calculates at all and, and, and triggered a cascading series of events that led to military conflict with Iran. I think that the, the Iranian um, government certainly doesn't want that. And I think the Revolutionary Guard wants that because it would be against their interests. That would be very damaging. Uh, we need to bear in mind the human tragedy that was the Iran-Iraq war. Eight, eight years that resolved nothing and just caused immense suffering uh, and, and consolidated the power of the Revolutionary Guard, by the way. I, I think uh, there needs to be more creative solutions to engage uh, the regime in Tehran. I, I don't say appease. Um, I think uh, one of the, the dilemmas is uh, there's not any realistic hope in any short-term way of so-called regime change, but there is a realistic hope of strengthening more moderate elements of the government and uh, serving to, to empower those more moderate elements to uh, limit the power of the Revolutionary Guard. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated calculus. I'm not saying anything is simple or easy, uh, but uh, <coughs> If indeed we don't see a second Trump term and if we see an administration around Joe Biden, all the indications are that it would be a, a much more conventional administration and would probably have some very good people in it. Uh, and I think that um, it would, you know, the expectations that would bring a depth of expertise. Joe Biden himself is, is an unusual sort of avuncular character, but I think his administration would be very, uh, very much a, a change from the current administration where Trump has never managed to fill his senior administration, uh, or at least the middle tier ranks, and, and has lost some very good people from the senior ranks. Um, it's, it's not a strong administration. So I think if we had a, a Biden administration, what would it mean for Iran? It, it means that there would be uh, an endeavor to look again at how to negotiate with the government in Iran and how to pay attention to this issue I raise of, of strengthening more relatively more moderate elements against uh, the very reactionary uh, elements of the Revolutionary Guard, and 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 engaging in some process of re of diminishing sanctions in a way that um, uh, you know is a, is a pathway out of the current impasse. 
I, I think we need to understand, and, and, and Kareem has alluded to this already, that um, you know, apart from the longer history of the region, um, in more recent years, there's been this um, uh, power contest between uh, an axis around Saudi Arabia, uh, ostensibly a Sunni axis, and an axis around Iran, uh, ostensibly a Shia axis. Uh, of course, the invasion of, of Iraq in 2003 opened up uh, a possibility in Iraq, and not just for Shia, the Shia majority to get political power, which was, you know, a, in, in itself a good thing. Uh, but in that destabilized um, political uh, vacuum, it saw obviously Sunni uh, extremist insurgencies emerge, particularly Al Qaeda, then Islamic State. But it also saw I Iran step in and um, ironically, to some extent, act in alliance with our own interests against Islamic State and, and other forces. But of course, gain much greater uh, opportunity in Iraq and then in Syria after civil war. Uh, and that's been, you know, extremely concerning. And the Revolutionary Guard and the Quds Force is, is playing a, a, a leading role there. So that dominates the current, um, uh, you know, power dynamic. Um, it's not simple and there's not easy options. Uh, but I do think we need to, to find ways in engaging the government in uh, Tehran and uh, trying to uh, strengthen more moderate elements and, and recognize that um, you know, this is in the interest of the people of Iran, it's in the interest of the people of the greater Middle East, uh, it's in the interest of world peace. Um, there's, there's, there's sort of tough work that needs to be done. Uh, so I think the question is not who does, it, uh, who, who does the regime, or, or you know, it's a question of which element of the regime do you mean the revolution regard or, and, and those around, um, uh, the religious leadership, or do you mean the, the um, relatively more moderate parliamentary aspect of the regime? But anyway, it's not a question of whether the regime prefers Trump or Biden. It's a, it's a question of what is, is, is best for the region and for the world. And uh, I, I would suggest the best, best path forth is, is to break away from this simplistic um, uh, reductionist approach that says either you're with the, the uh, Saudi bloc or with the Iranian bloc, uh, and take your side. That's 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 there's there's no future for anyone in that. Uh, we have to find a way of breaking down the impasse. Um, it, the regime in Iran is cornered. Its back is against the wall. Um, uh, the most dangerous aspect of the regime is the Revolutionary Guard, and it's prepared to use force and whatever methods it takes uh, in that situation. I think part of the uh, response has to be to de-escalate and provide a way out in a way that's of, to everyone's benefit. Okay, thank you. I've got a uh, question, I think, from Jim McElroy. I'll just read it out of the chat. He said, I visited Iran during the Shah's regime and fully understand the reason for the 1979 revolution. The revolution was taken over by the Islamic fundamentalists, unfortunately. Many leftist minorities and others have been killed. But to understand the current situation, we have to note the context. Iran faces a massive coalition of enemies led by US, Saudi Arabia and Israel and illegal sanctions which reinforce the undemocratic regime. Lifting the sanctions would be the best way to open the way to a democratic path for Iran and to release the democratic struggle there, including the release of political prisoners such as Kylie Moore Gilbert. Would you comment please? Just similar to what you're saying there um, at the end there, Greg. But uh, Karim, would you like to respond to Jim or Greg? I agree with Jim uh, in case that um, sanctions did no no good to to the whole Iranian political situation. It just uh, um, just made the uh, the Iranian society armless um, and. Uh, poorer and left the regime to be more brutal even against the society. And as I said, in other cases, which uh, the societies will, which uh, they were subject to uh, international sanctions, nothing good came out of that. Uh, the, uh, in, in, a, in a tough situation where, uh, where sanctions and, and, and difficult uh, condition um, tearing apart the fabric of the society, the society don't go to our democracy and, and more moderate. They just, uh, I mean, I left Iran in 2006 when, when I was <clears throat> talking to people in Iran in 2009. In only two years, like new crimes were, were introduced to the societies. 
So <clears throat> tough conditions don't bring democracy anywhere. This wasn't the case in UK. This wasn't the case in Japan. This wasn't the case uh, in, in, uh, in anywhere else. Um, democracy has a different route to, to be achieved. Um, in terms of, um, uh, sorry, is there any, any other point that I have to comment on? I don't think so. No. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, there's another question. It comes from Stephen uh, or comment. I am no fan of the Iranian regime, but Noam Chomsky sometimes says that compared to the Saudi regime, just that the Saudi regime is much worse. I don't like comparisons, but it does help to keep things in proportion. I dislike the demonization of Iran, which is one of, way of paving the path to war, which would help no one and would be, as Karim says, I think a disaster. So there's a comment if you like, anyone wants to comment back. Sure, look, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good comment. Um, it, it's um, difficult to argue with. I mean, so the, in a sense, there's, there's not much to say. Uh, that's, you know, uh, it's, it's very sort of um, astute observation. Um, but I guess the thing to unpack here is that uh, I, I agree with Karim that um, sanctions haven't yielded the result we want in Iran. Uh, they've been really tough for the people of Iran. Of course, it's the people of Iran who have suffered very badly. People sometimes say that sanctions don't work in terms of their you know, primary objective of, of, of um, limiting economic opportunity. That's not entirely the case with Iran. The sanctions have hit very, very hard, uh, but it's ordinary Iranians have been most hard hit. And the Revolutionary Guard in its perverse conditions have done okay. Um, you know, they, they, they benefit from, from the tough conditions. They control the black market, the smuggling. Um, but ordinary Iranians, are, 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 you know, it's very hard done by it doesn't help them. It doesn't help the cause of, of tr you know, trying to promote um, sensible uh, political path forward just to keep uh, using this very blunt instrument. And I think one of the, the tragedies of the Trump administration is, you know, out of heartlessness and, and, and lack of insight um, and lack of real moral um, concern, it's pushed ahead with this very blunt instrument, but also it's played this very simplistic game of, of you know, either you're with Saudi Arabia or you're with Iran in the region. And in and Saudi Arabia, um, the sanctions haven't helped make things better in Iran. Uh, cozying up uncritically to the Saudi regime hasn't helped either. Uh, there was, you know, a momentary glimmer of hope that uh, when Mohammed bin Salman was announced as crown prince, that that might be the beginning of a younger um, you know, demographic uh, change towards a, a, a more progressive and more open Saudi Arabia. But Mohammed bin Salman has proven himself to be a, a ruthless and um, immoral uh, uh, leader, acting unwisely, uh, acting with, um, you know, just complete disregard for the human rights of, of Saudi citizens. Uh, of course, there's the, the, uh, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, but of many others as well, the constant use of intimidation, um, you know, even calling in the elites, uh, political and, and uh, economic elites of uh, Saudi and basically telling them that you'll suffer the same fate if you don't give me what I want. Now, that's no way to reinvent the Saudi economy. That's just completely counterproductive. Um, and to the extent that sort of Western alliance with Saudi Arabia uh, strengthens those impulses, then that's not good for anyone, uh, least of all the people of Saudi Arabia and the people of the, of the Middle East in general. So we need to find a way of, of, of not uh, playing this, you know, uh, foolish um, uh, binary game of, of choosing enemies and friends and uh, my enemy's enemy being my friend. That's, that's really produced horrible results from the Middle East in particular. Um, and I, I agree, of course, that demonizing Iran doesn't make sense, just like it, we should be cautious about demonizing Saudi Arabia or the people of Saudi Arabia or, yeah. you know, demonizing China, the people of China. But we're dealing with elements of regimes that are particularly problematic that we want to be critical about. And we want to suggest a path forward. Uh, we're not we're not demonizing entire nations or even necessarily speaking uh, broadly of governments. We're, we're, we're identifying the particular problem elements and saying, what can we do that will make things better to help those who are trying to bring about change? Mm. Thank you. I, I think I'll just make a comment on my own now, um, because you know the way I perceive what Trump has done was all about un, you know a domestic political agenda, uh, undoing Obama's legacy, whatever. You know, it was mostly it, I think, and the um, 
there's, there's really no thought for what happens to the people of Iran. I don't think those sort of uh, hyper strategic people like Bannon and, and whatever extent Trump is one, um, uh, think that the Iranian people, or see, they don't seem to think the Iranian people have got any role to play in changing their own society. And, uh, you know, there's various assessments of how much upheaval there is inside the country. But I, I'm pretty sure there's been, you know, several years now since late 2017, um, pretty well rolling bigger and bigger waves of strikes and, and rallies and protests, which have very much frightened the, the government. Um, so surely these, this is an element in the picture for change for the better, which no one's really wanting to connect to very much. But, you know, these different, uh, like Europe, North America, even Australia. Is there any uh, view you've got, either of you, about that aspect? Just, just a note of caution, Peter. I mean, I, I, I don't doubt that the people of Iran want to, want to see a more open society and they mm. want to see justice and they certainly want to see life getting back to a more normal situation economically in every other respect. Um, it's reasonable to assume that um, there is a strong um, desire for a more accountable government system. Uh, there's a strong desire for more personal freedom. Um, uh, you know, that we, we can reasonably uh, read from what we understand that um, top-down imposition of a certain approach to uh, imposing religiosity for political purposes is, is you know, uh, very, very much yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, you could say, in a sense, there's a groundswell for democracy, I and mean, it's more complicated than that. But the note of caution is this, that if we, if we think that standing on the wings and, and cheering on sort of um, people rising up um, is necessary in their interest, we need to be very cautious because we see completely ruthless um, force applied to intimidate and to frighten those who would speak out. So we need to think very carefully about how, how best to open up a way forward, not, not just for the people of Iran, but for the government of Iran, uh, so that more moderate elements uh, can predominate to a larger extent and, uh, and more reactionary and more harsh elements will have less opportunity to completely hold sway. Um, that sounds like uh, it's compromise, but you know, it's compromise in the sense that I think an idealistic approach that says we just get behind the people and support their uprising doesn't understand the price that people will pay and how likely it is that such hopes will be thwarted in the most cruel fashion. We need to be more intelligent about how we help them. Karim, have you any comment on that? Uh, yes, uh, the protests in Iran are actually increasing. Uh, the first mass protest, uh, protest happened in, in, uh, during the, in the time of Khatami when, when he uh, claimed to be a reformist president um, in late 1990s. Yeah, he came to, uh, he, was, he was elected as president in 97. Um, and since then, we started to see like mass protests happening uh, uh, first each decade, but now each, uh, each two, three years. And uh, if there was no pandemic, actually just before the start of uh, pandemic, there was like massive protest. Uh, which um, in all of them, the, the regime responded uh, brutally. But again, the protests are becoming more violent. There is one thing to say about uh, the protests is just this are mostly people um, who disadvantaged, have nothing to lose and came to, to the street to demand um, democracy, better conditions, um, better economic uh, conditions and economic prosperity and so on. But there, in terms of political uh, alternative to, to alter the, the current uh, regime, um, there is no an organic opposition inside uh, Iran. Unfortunately, the opposition, which is outside Iran, is mostly, um, um, how can I put it? Like, uh, uh, they are receiving money from, uh, from different uh, States now even uh, the Saudi Arabia and, and uh, Israel came came to to support some uh, some some of these this uh, so-called opposition and even creating their own uh, um, Farsi-speaking uh, TV channels. But unfortunately, all of this uh, media do not reflect what 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 people uh, organically uh, need inside Iran and. Um, 
uh, the native need, need of the, the, the Iranian people. All of this, unsurprisingly, of course, all of this um, TV channels and the money spent on the opposition outside is to reflect the interest of the, uh, uh, this states who supporting um, this uh, political forces. Sometimes they, they speak language which people inside Iran, they don't even understand. I mean, they are speaking about something that <laughs> the people can't relate to, mm. uh, showing food that people ca can't relate to inside Iran and talking about some values which are not really uh, urgent in Iran and things like that. So, um, I mean, as Greg said, uh, finding uh, a way to genuinely help uh, Iran, Iranian people to overcome uh, their current situation and the, uh, their current political establishment is really the big ta task and the big challenge here. Okay. Uh, Peter, Peter, I think it, yeah, I, I completely agree with what Karim is saying. I think we need to you know, just put this in the broader context and remember that our optimism about the Arab Spring, so-called in 2011, um, you know, it didn't end as we hoped. Um, and it's not because people protesting weren't sincere and, and brave and courageous. And it's not that we were you know, wrong to, to wish them well. Uh, but we need to recognize how hard it is to bring about the, the changes that everyone desires. Um, the, the tragedy of the Arab Spring lives on today in, in Syria in the most horrible way and in a way that's not as horrible but, but pretty awful in, in Egypt. Uh, it's only in um, Tunisia we've seen something relatively promising occur. Yeah. Uh, but it speaks to how dangerous it is to, to think that... Um, it's just a question of getting behind democratic uprisings and supporting them and, and everything will come out right. Um, it's, 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 it's tougher than that. And if we don't think realistically, as Karim is suggesting, um, you know, we'll end up um, perhaps for the best of reasons, but, but perhaps with the worst of results, uh, not helping things. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's one more uh, question. Uh, Again, from Jim McElroy. Um, he's asking uh, for a comment specifically on the role of Israel in demonizing Iran, including the nature of the recent UAE deal in consolidating the anti-Iran bloc. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's a little bit too terse probably the way he's put it, but can you pick up on that? I think when we speak about, I mean, you know, we speak about any country, including a democracy, and of course Israel is a democracy, uh, even in a democracy, um, you know, it, it makes sense, we know this in Australia, not to speak in, in singular terms. So um, it's a peculiarity of Israeli history that the Knesset is structured the way it is. Um, many would say that, um, you know, with the wisdom of hindsight, it should have been structured differently because it gives outsized uh, power to small voices and the current uh, government of Benjamin um, Netanyahu uh, reflects some of those dynamics. So it, it is true that in Netanyahu's government, there has been an element, and it's not just in Netanyahu's government, I mean, it goes beyond him, but, but, but let's, let's sort of put it in the focus. Uh, there's an element that um, really fixates on uh, Iran and um, uh, pushes anything which, which pushes back against Iran now, uh, uh, there are more nuanced readings that, that recognize that I Iran has, you know, targeted Israel in particular ways and that there's reasons for Israel to be concerned. I think we need to accept that. Um, but there is a, a kind of um, simple zero sum um, calculation that goes around with some political actors in uh, Israel and, and, and some in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, that says either you're with our team uh, supporting the way we do things and Iran's the enemy or, or you know, you're part of the problem. I, I think it's actually good in abstract terms uh, that uh, diplomatic relationships can be established across the, the, the region. I, I think it's better to have dialogue and diplomatic exchange than not to have it. So um, the fact that there should be a diplomatic um, avenues between the UAE and Israel is 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 you know, it's potentially a very good thing, but of course it depends at, at how it's done and, and what else, you know, comes in that process. And, and uh, I don't argue against the Israeli concern about Iran, but I think that a simplistic pushing uh, of, 
of an analysis that says, well, better we line up with the Saudis and go against the Iranians because um, otherwise it's going to be awful, you know, fails to see the complexity that we're talking about and, and um, doesn't even reflect the, the full range of opinions within, within the Israeli democracy itself. Okay. Uh, uh, may I talk about different aspect of the the uh, uh, the question, which um, I don't think it's, it's only demonization when it's come to to Israel policies toward Iran, um, and also this is relevant to what we are talking uh, today, um, because I mean I'm not convinced that Dr. Gilbert is uh, is a spy or anything but we also have to sometimes give the benefit of the doubt to to the uh, iranian ruling elite uh, the regime which um, i mean iran is currently uh, a state with very few friends around the world and with too many enemies around the world um, both israel and saudi arabia has a lot have long history of sabotage spy uh, sorry, sorry sabotage assassination and uh, um, terrorist activities inside Iran. And what one could uh, imagine that they couldn't do that without the help of some local people. So they are interested to have a spies there. Um, and and um, the, uh, both Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, they, uh, I mean, if, if we look at the Iranian uh, the Iraqi war, in, which started in 1981, and we see the amount of, of financial and, and other type of support that Saudi Arabia gave Iraq. We can also consider that war, uh, that, that war as a proxy war which Saudi Arabia uh, waged against Iran. Um, so there is a long history of conflict, actual conflict between these states from both sides. Um, and that shouldn't be uh, neglected, neglected and just... Uh, I mean, I, I totally agree with, with Greg. Uh, it, it's helped no one that we, we, dis, we divide the, the, the region into two camps, Iranian camp and Saudi Arabian camp, and okay, let's decide which camp to support. This, this just enters mm -hmm. us into an uh, unending conflict. There is no end in sight to this. Um, but also when it comes to uh, conflict, it's, it's too sad. And Israel and, and Saudi Arabia are the stronger party. They have more means to, to uh, push uh, against Iran, both violently in terms of intelligence and, and demonization. In terms of media, Iran have nothing to say um, when it comes against Saudi Arabia or, or to Saudi Arabia and Israel. But um, both the states are even strong in terms of media. Uh, Saudi Arabia owns more than 50% uh, of uh, the entire Middle Eastern media, and that includes uh, media which are operating based on Farsi and Urdu and, and different uh, uh, languages than, than uh, Mera Arabic uh, media. Uh, the second and third uh, media shareholders in the region are Qatar and uh, UAE, which are, they are very close to, to Saudi Arabia's uh, policies when it comes to Iran. Um, Israel also uh, is powerful in terms of using media uh, as part of, let's say, propaganda war. Um, Iran has nothing to say in this field. Um, so, I mean, the dynamic of the conflict there is, is, is from both sides. It's, it's not only fault of one on this side. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's very common among Iranian commentators uh, and, and Farsi speaking commentators to say the Iranian ruling elite are doing what they are doing because they are idiots. I don't think they are idiots and, and idiocy help no one, uh, or, or idiocy is not the right tool to understand any foreign policy. Um, as basically, um, the, the Iranian ruling elites are doing what they are doing most of the time. It's, it's unconventional and strange because that's the only means they, they, they have, including using like uh, proxy Shia uh, fighters and, uh, and others. But um, the, the, the history of the conflict of, of Israel and, and, and Saudi Arabia and what they are doing and pushing toward conflicts against Iran must, but must not be neglected from any, any analysis when it comes to the Middle East. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. We don't have any more comments coming through and we're up to five past eight, so I'll move to wrap it up. Um, I want to give a heartfelt thanks to both Karim and Greg for your inputs tonight. It's a, um, a hard area actually to engage. Um, 
and it's one that's very important that more Australians talk about and get informed about. Um, let's um, just just announce the topic for next week. No, sorry, it's a fortnight on Tuesday, the sixth of October. It's on the U.S. elections. Is Trump versus democracy the real issue? Our speaker at the moment is Jonathan Lockhart. He's a U.S. freelance journalist, and we're looking for a second speaker to join that program still. So um, we'll be advertising that, and I hope we we will do that live in the Hotel Harry in uh, Surrey Hills, and hopefully people will be feeling more confident about coming out as the pandemic is more suppressed in Australia, um, as it seems to be the evidence at the moment. So uh, once again, thank you very much, everybody. The video from tonight will be on the uh, YouTube channel and the website of politicsinthepub.org.au. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, thanks, Karen. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.